Justin Marshall then joins us. Marshy, we're still talking about it, mate. Four days later, you're talking about it last night. We're still talking about it. Well, I knew we would be, Steves. Um, good afternoon to you and good everybody. Uh, look, there's no doubt about the fact that uh, when you have a finish like that and there is controversy involved, and there, there certainly was uh, a heap of that, that it was going to be debated and talked about from both perspectives for many days, if not longer, and uh, I'm not surprised that that's the case. Okay, so JK was saying last night um, on the breakdown, he was saying that, um, look, you know, this has got to be taken out of the referee's hands, this time-wasting thing. Uh, I, I, I don't know then who gets to control it. Please tell me that it wouldn't be the TMO. But is, is, what, he, is what he is suggesting, is it stopping the clock when, when play stops? Um, yeah, basically, I think what, what, what they want to do is they want to make sure that more than anything, the ga- what the game needs, it needs the ball uh, in play more. And, and at the moment, there's too many instances where that's not the case. Um, so basically what we need now is we need uh, to try and get the game flowing enough that when, when there are uh, instances where there's a, I guess, uh, scrum repeatedly going down, the front rows aren't coping, that the referee just goes, you know what, from now on I'm stopping the clock until the scrums um, actually become m- more consistent. And, and so, because sometimes you can have a bad day of scrummaging where mm. front rows are constantly collapsing, we're constantly getting resets, and that, that accumulates to around quarter of an hour of time. And it's a long time yep. in a rugby game. So I hear what you're saying about what JK was saying. Look, I, I don't know what the solution is to, but I do understand that we we are getting a lot of time being taken up unnecessarily in the game at the moment. And that's what people don't want to see. So, you know, when you look at it holistically, and I suppose, I mean, this is the trouble, isn't it? When you look at it holistically, I thought there was an absolutely cracking game of rugby, mate. I thought we'd, we'd, I thought we'd blown it. I thought we'd trodden on our own feet. At 31-13... The All Blacks have got to shut that guy, that thing down. You don't, you don't let an eighteen-point lead slip. Have we, have we kind of let the team get away with that a little bit because of the ending and the focus on the ending? Oh, I certainly don't feel that they will be feeling that way um, to a degree. But a lot of the, the basically fallout from the game has come, as you mentioned, from that last-minute decision. But in general, when Ian Foster and the rest of the side, including the leadership group, sat down and reviewed that game. Um, funnily enough, probably reviewed it on a Friday because it was such yes. a weird um, event being on a Thursday night. But, you know, you usually say Monday morning, but they would have been well past it by Monday morning. But anyway, I digress. The thing, what I'm trying, the, the point I'm trying to make is, yes, that they would have seen many missed opportunities there. And fundamental errors that the All Blacks have been making regularly. They were, they were not under pressure. They, they were errors that basically... Uh, lacked patience and, and lacked a little bit of thought process and a little hint of panic when they ne- didn't need to panic. They'd made line breaks. A couple of them were quite significant line breaks and basically coughed or spilled the ball or made a bad decision. And that's been happening quite regularly. So, look, the fact that they can still compete in test matches at the moment and, and still make those errors is a massive positive. Uh, you know, like in big pressure games that they've got, that, that they've got, coming up and, and, you know, further into next year with the World Cup, they need to extricate them from, from the game, big time. So, you know, if, I mean, you know, you, you, you take away that ending. Did we do the right thing? When you talk about winning the, the rugby championship, which has got to be foremost up in that mind, did, I mean, was it the right idea to go for touch when we could have got a draw out of that? I know a draw is a scungy result and everyone hates it, but if you're talk, talking about winning the overall competition, aren't the points more important? <laughs> just had a little snigger to myself. I've had the word scungy for a very long time, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but, but mind you, I'm good at making up words as well, so go on. we won't go into that any further. But look, yeah, yes, um, it was it was a very bold decision from Sam Whitelock to to go for, I, I guess, a juggler and, and win, the, win the Bledis Low Cup there and then. Like many people say and have been saying, and even Nick White obviously said the Rugby Championship, but more importantly, the Blenderslow Cup, that, that was the Blenderslow Cup right there and then. You know, if, if, if it's a draw, it goes to Eden Park. If you win it there, it, it, that's it. It's secured, it's in the cabinet again, and then you focus on rugby championship, which you can still win. You know, yes, if the All Blacks had lost, it would have made it a massive mountain to climb given the Springboks result against Argentina. But I think first and foremost, at the forefront of Sam Whitelock's thinking was the Blenderslow. It means a massive, massive amount to the All Blacks. So... 
Um, yeah, I, 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 the decision was a big one, and well, yeah, I don't know whether that was the right decision or not, but I like the fact that the All Blacks prepared to back themselves, um, and I think that's got to be the mantra in moving forward, not, not to be a negative team, but to be a team with some arrogance, like we used to be, and go out there and say, you know what, we're better than going for a draw, we'll beat you. Justin Marshall with this 81 Test veteran of the All Blacks, and of course... Sky Sports, sitting there riding shotgun during the calls, rugby breakdown, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so, I mean, you know, because we got away with it, we got away with it. And look, and, you know, you can go back through 100 test matches, mate, and you've said this on the program before. You sat in the dressing room afterwards and actually looked around and thought, my God, how the hell did we get out, out of that with a win? But you got out with a win, and that's the only thing that counts at this level of sport. I know that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and look, regardless of... Um what everybody thinks about that decision. And, you know, my, my viewpoint is, uh, yes, it's a problem in the game. Um, yes, there needs to probably be a directive to fix it. But, no, making a, a call like that when the game's on the line um, and a trophy like the Bledisloe is on the line for a side that had earned themselves the penalty uh, to, to go ahead and win the game was, you know, that, that's probably the wrong time to start making that directive in the game to speed the game up. But regardless of that, throughout the course of any contest, you'll have moments you win or lose. And let's face it, there's probably a big argument that uh, the Wallabies should have been down to 14 men yep. for what happened to Quinton Byer. So, you know, the All Blacks could always throw that argument out there. So, look, there's lots of different dynamics that come into it. Probably the most pivotal thing that I found um, quite re refreshing and also uh, a massive, again, positive for the All Blacks, uh, Marty, was even though that decision went their way, they still made three or four really good decisions before Julie Barrett scored that try. There, there were a couple of goes at the line. There was instances where players could have reached out, probably been done for double movements. I, I'm, I'm not. It might have been Dane Cole, someone who went really close. Um, Akira's decision off the back of the scrum. We had a Nick White sweating all over him, um, looking to turn him over. Could have slapped his hand, slapped the ball down. He did well to maintain the ball. And then the finish and the composure of, of Will Jordan and Geordie Barrett. So what I'm saying is the All Blacks still had to, to a mountain to climb and they still had to be incredibly accurate to win that test. And they did. And that's what will be really pleasing please when they did that review. Hey, yeah, maybe we got that chance by a fluke or by a poor decision, but we still had to get the job done. And they did. Justin Marshall then with us on the platform. All right, I've got three things to talk to you about before we wrap all of this up. Obviously, selections going into this particular test, Darcy Swain's hearing tonight, and the Ranfurly Shield. Because I know that you still remember that Steve Walsh Ranfurly Shield challenge. And so, <laughs> so, <laughs> mate, I tell, I've got a great story to tell you about that. But anyway, so let Darcy... Let it go, Marty. Let it go, Darcy, let it go. <laughs> You know I can't. Darcy Swain's hearing tonight. Now, look, it is... There's no sport in the world that punishes somebody for foul play um, in this... You know, and what I'm trying to get at here is give you the same amount of weeks that the person who is injured gets. It's a real shame that that's not the case because every single aspect of that was foul and it was wrong... And, and, you know, I just don't know how else you discipline a guy like Swain and get it through his head other than, mate, you can't put somebody else out of the game for months at a time and then you get to play again in a couple of weeks. That just doesn't seem fair under any, I don't know, set of rules or regulations. No, it doesn't. And, and players don't learn unless they get uh, penalised in this environment. Now, th this, is the best, this is the best and ultimate environment in the game. Now, it does hurt to miss a club game and it does hurt, it hurt to miss a, a national championship game, game or even a super rugby game hurts a, a lot more. But when you when you get the, the playing for your nation taken away from you and you see somebody else get opportunities in your jersey, whether it's jersey number four or five or never, jersey 17, 18, whatever it might be, doesn't matter. You're still in the national side. And when, when you get that taken away from you because of poor discipline and repeated poor discipline, um, you know, that, that really then affects your, uh, I guess, your longevity in the game to a degree and, and your ability uh, to be selected again because you become a liability. So, look, the, the fact that this is happening in this, this particular window is a good thing because the Wallabies are going on end of year tour as well. Um, and I would imagine there's no more rugby from after the rugby championship from them. So whatever sanction Swain gets will be completely uh, on top of uh, international rugby. He, he could miss the, the remainder of the year for the Wallabies. 
that's the type of penalties players need to learn their lesson. What would you give him, mate? <laughs> Uppercut? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, look, uh, you know, what he's done um, is, look, I, I had many instances in the game. Look, I, mate, I got Simbin one time for allegedly, um, basically, they, they said on purpose stood on Byron Callis' hand. That's right, I remember. And I got I got stood down, yeah. Right, I mean. It was an absolute, I, did, I didn't like Byron, and I, and I really enjoyed playing against him and winding him up, but I, but I didn't intentionally stand on his hand. It was all just in the mo- moment. So, look... I did. Did he, did he go in there with the intent and then execute the uh, to take out Quinn Tapia's leg? Like really? Um, look, I think more than anything, he's been incredibly clumsy. He's been illegal, and he's got it wrong in what he was trying to do. But I don't think that he had any intent to um, to, to basically Literally cripple yeah. Quinn Tapia. Yeah, I, I think what he did was illegal and it was stupid. Um, but intent is a big part of it, and I, I question if any player's got the ability to go out there and, and intentionally take a guy's knee out and success, successfully do it in, in that split second. So, um, in, a, in a nutshell, though, mate, six weeks. Yeah. That's the rest of the year. Okay. Yeah, the rest of the year. But, you know, you're right, I mean, and, and I would hope, I hope you're right, Justin, because I don't, you know, just the idea that somebody would do that, I mean, that's such a violent thing to do. I mean, it's, it's street thuggery is what it is. I thought, you know, my initial reaction was what a cowardly thing to do. But you got to hope that, yeah. that that no one is that much of a meathead. That, that that's what they'd be. However, I I think with this particular player, I really wonder what Dave Rennie says to him because he goes out there like a wrecking ball, doesn't he? And he does. He plays with a lot of ill discipline. So I'm wondering whether he's been told to go out there and just cause chaos and havoc. And he's not. He, he hasn't got enough self control. Maybe that's all part of this <laughs> big soup bowl. I, I think Dave Dave Rennie will be incredibly motivated to get. Uh, some discipline in, into him. Um, I think that's what ultimately he's seeking because you know what, Marty? You actually need that little bit of yeast, that little bit of niggle out there where, where the opposition are coming to a breakdown and they're watching out for a bloke. Yep. Because it makes you think twice about being in the wrong position or whatever because if you are and they've got that sort of mongrel about them, they will take your ribs out if they're exposed if your technique is not bang on. Now, you know, that, that's certainly a type of player that you need to bring the physicality to your side, which is which is something Australia haven't had for a long time. They've been out physical by their opponents, and particularly the All Blacks in the last decade. So, I go, I, go, I think of Lavanini for Argentina. He got a yellow card. I think it was in Hamilton, but um, he's actually his discipline has come a hell of a long way, and he's now turned into one of the premier locks in the world. I think Michael Cech has had a, a massive influence on him, and he's he's reined that 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 aggro out of him to a degree. You still see it. You can still see that at any time he's a bit of a ticking bomb. He could explode. But you're also very aware of his physical presence on the field. So I think Dave Rennie, what he needs to get out of him um, is he needs to get the same thing as Lavanini. He needs to control that aggression because the Wallabies need it. They need a guy like that, I believe. I'm sitting here, I wrote a couple of names down. Michael Bryle, or I know you remember him, and also Barkis Butter. Yeah, and, I do. Yeah, and, you know, and, yeah. Both, and both of those guys had that same... Kind of thing. All right. Martin Johnson. Yeah, well, but you know, but we ad- we admire him, don't we? I mean, like you know, and certainly yeah. in club rugby over there, he used to put the slipper. In, no question about that. And also, just oh, in, yeah. just in terms of the Barretts, Mister Barrett, Mister Smiley had a smiler on him too, mate. And I saw that on a few occasions. So you know, yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely right. You know, there's been players like that across the board. Like I played with Richard Lowe, and oh, I love Lowe, mate. It was great playing. It was great, it was great playing with Lowe because of that very thing. When I saw him going to a breakdown in the halfback, I knew pretty much the second third arriving player. I was going to get good, clean ball yep. because it was ever in that breakdown was getting out of his way. <laughs> 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 All right, let's move into the selections then. Artie comes straight back at eight, providing you know the baby's all been born, everything he's, he's uh, posted, and congratulations to the family. He comes back at eight. Second five though. So what do you do? Do you rearrange the whole back line? Do you move Will Jordan? Do you put Jordy in at second five? Do you add a right winger or do you just go, we've got a second five who's sitting there, we've got a pr- pretty much a blues back line and you put Roger in or does he come off the bench? What do you do? Well, probably the, the worry for Roger is the fact that the, the All Blacks um, have been reluctant to use them at all and they've, they've released them to play for for Auckland. So he's kind of been in and out of the environment and he hasn't really got any consistency uh, in terms of probably training time um, and more importantly game time uh, within that All Black mix. And they are super after consistency this side at the moment. Um, 
And as we as we saw it the, on Tuesday night, there are still a, a little. There's still a little bit of frailty there. The, the other side of it that worries me a little bit, um, Debs, and this is no slight on um, uh, Roger Tuivasa Sheik by any means, is we, we are still lacking quite a bit of leadership out there, and at crucial times, discipline and a lack of making good decisions and having good leadership is letting the All Blacks down. And I think, you know, if you can keep Geordie Barrett in the mix by keeping him at 12, he's played plenty of tests now, he's been to big games, he's been to World Cup, so he's got more experience. And, and what is going to be a high-pressured, high-intensity environment at Eden Park? You know, the Bledisloe Cup is secure, yes, but Australia will be coming with a certain amount of intent. They'll be pretty pissed off side, I'd imagine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a full house. And I just don't feel that Roger's got enough um, big game experience and uh, head experience in terms of leadership in a really important jersey, a decision-making jersey for a test match of this significance. Like, I wouldn't be surprised to see him say, do persevere, which I believe they should and will, uh, play against Japan which is the next test after that. So that's my two cents worth in terms of that. I expect them to move Will Jordan to fullback, where he played a lot of the tests at the weekend, um, and possibly bring in um, Sevu Reese. All right, finally then the Ranfilly Shield, and Wellington get it. Uh, 2008 was the last time. Um, and I just wanted to... We've got Leo Crowley coach on in, in about half an hour, an hour, uh, something like that. I just What I love about this, mate, is to... To those of us who it matters to, it really does matter. And I, I know that it's lost a little in terms of the, the, the new generations. I mean, back in the days, there were... I mean, people weren't even... We can't even talk about this stuff, Justin. There were parades. I remember in Wellington, mm. the frying lamb in a barbecue in Courtney Place before coming down and getting spanked <laughs> by your love by 60 points. But, I mean, all of that stuff was just... It's part of the legend of it, isn't it? There's something about that stupid bit of wood, mate, which I love the fact it still means what it means to people. It's absolutely imperative that it stays in our game and it still has the significance of its history. Uh, Realised by current players, young players that probably didn't see it maybe to the extent that we're talking about back in the day, but I still feel that it has a massive draw card. And you only have to look at what what it's done for Hawke's Bay Rugby uh, in the last two to three years. Like The fact that they are uh, getting nearly full attendances each week and the type of rugby that they've They've played the Shield challenges that have been dramatic. Um, the fact that they've snuck games on the whistle because the Shield means so much. You know what, mate? This is to be perfectly honest. I don't, and I don't mean this disrespect to, uh, for dis- in disrespect, but this is the shot in the arm that Wellington Rugby needs. Like I've, I've been to that stadium and commentating during the, um, the, the Bunnings NPC, and it, it is hard to get a really good atmosphere there. Yeah, it's a big yeah. stadium. And they're a, a really good group of loyal supporters, but they are also quite fickle. Um, so they'll come depending on the conditions, and equally they'll come depending on how well the team's going. I, I would expect that stadium to be near half full at the weekend. Let's hope so. More. Yeah, and let's hope so. I, I feel that that's what, that, that's that's how much I think a big a big side like Wellington, a big Super Rugby franchise with great players in it how much of a shot in an arm near rugby needs. It'll be yeah. great for the union and it'll be great for their supporters. So get along there, man. It's going to be a great game. Well, Canada have probably got the second best Shield history. Yes. Or third, maybe, uh, in, in the country. They're, they're a very proud team and they'll come with everything they've got. and They'll have former Shield players come in and talk to them this week because that's what they do. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're always battlers when it comes to the Shield. So what a... What a great thing for New Zealand rugby. This really, really shield, mate. Bloody love it. Yeah, see, this is it. I'm glad, glad you said that. And also, Justin, just finally, as as a player, like when, when you when you were playing, that what I loved about it was that it just meant everything on the day. And I kind of feel that with professional yep. rugby that we don't actually get enough of these games where the players just have to be told, I don't give a stuff what happens to score more points than them. That's all that actually counts. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. the nearest kind of mentality to test match rugby that we have, isn't it? It is. Yep, and, and it's, it's, it's an absolute uh, do-or-die type scenario. It's a playoff every single week. You're either in or you lose the trophy, and, and it's as simple as that. And it means that you've got to pour everything you've got into that game. And the handshakes and the smiles afterwards, if you lose that shield, they are incredibly uncomfortable and they hurt. Yeah. Whereas just a normal game of rugby, you can swallow the loss and say that you're going to do better the following week and get the points, but the... But when the shield's gone, it's gone, and and that's it. There, there's no there's no other way to sum it up than if you don't give it everything, the opposition certainly will because they want it in their house. 
and you've got to make sure that you go out there and as the cliche always go, you've got to win that shield each week, regardless of the fact that you're the holder. Awesome, mate. Lovely talking to you. Love talking to you every single Monday. Thanks so much again. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. Likewise. Cheers.